Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Book of Revelation. This is now session 55. Last week we discussed the candidate of Rome or the Vatican. Could it be the great harlot? Could it be Babylon the Great that's spoken of in Revelation 17 and 18? Um, we looked at the strengths and the weaknesses and some of what I see to be the deal breakers with that particular view. But you really can't finish the discussion. You can't complete the discussion as to whether or not the Roman Catholic Church or the Vatican is indeed Babylon the Great without discussing what we're going to talk about today. This is kind of an unusual discussion, but it's very important. Um, it's something that sort of exists outside of the biblical text, but something that greatly influences the popular Christian interpretation of the text, and not only the popular Christian interpretation of Revelation 17 and 18, but also the popular Christian view of the world itself, and in particular the Roman Catholic Church, but not just the Roman Catholic Church, but a lot of other issues. What in the world are you talking about? Well, the title of this week's session is Don't Be a Nimrod. Okay, so Nimrod, of course, is a very important historical biblical figure. Um, back there in the beginning, uh, at the founding of the city of Babel, Nimrod was this great city builder. He was a very important Old Testament character. We don't read a tremendous amount about him in the Bible, but there's all kinds of stories and myths and extra-biblical legends about Nimrod, from which many Christian prophecy aficionados have really focused. And it's very important that we discuss the Nimrod myths or the Nimrod legends in order to try to tease out the difference between what is true and what is biblical and what we can know and these different ideas that are false. Okay, so don't be a Nimrod. So let's just start here. If we look to any number of Christian books, articles, um, all over the internet, but there's also been entire books written about this, specifically referring to the last days, um, we will find many incredibly detailed stories about the life and not just the past, but the future of Nimrod, okay? So this very important foundational Old Testament character. Now, according to the overarching story that you're going to find in these books and articles, Nimrod was married to a woman named Semiramis. Okay, together they started a religion that worships their child named Tammuz. Okay, so a Babylonian god Tammuz. So again, the story is Nimrod married Semiramis, and they together created a new religion that worships their child Tammuz. And through this ancient sort of primordial Babylonian satanic religion, from that sort of root or seed, this original foundational false religion has infected and infiltrated, and in fact, it is every other religion in the world today. So if you were to look to Roman Catholicism, people that ascribe to this whole Nimrod myth, this whole Nimrod legend, they would say modern day Roman Catholicism is literally just an extension, an expansion of this original Babylonian religion. And whereas the people worship Jesus and um, give uh, all kinds of devotion to his mother Mary, they would say this is actually just Semiramis and Tammuz disguised as Jesus and Mary. But this is actually no different than original, the original ancient Babylonian religion started by Nimrod. And again, you will find folks that adhere to this view thoroughly, but they'll go much further than that. They won't say it's just the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, they'll say all of the traditional churches like the Eastern Orthodox churches, the Anglican churches, any of these. The closer you are to Rome, either historically or just in terms of the form of your worship, the closer you are to the original Babylonian religion. That's the idea. But they will also say that the overwhelming majority of the Protestant denominations are also thoroughly infected by this false, demonic, satanic, Babylonian religion. And again, this is, it's almost like a comprehensive view through which to interpret everything in the world. They'll go on and say, 
Hinduism and Islam and all these other religions as well have also been infected by and are in many ways just extensions of the original Babylonian religion. And then, of course, the system of the Antichrist, the religion of the Antichrist, will simply be a revived version, a latter-day version of this original Babylonian religion. And so when you just sort of tell this story, you go, oh, wow, like, because what we as humans are often looking for is a grand meta narrative. We're looking for this grand story, an umbrella under which everything can be explained. This is true of virtually all conspiracy theories. And as soon as I use that word, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that get mad. Oh, all the conspiracy theories are true. You know, like after the couple of years of COVID, there's people like, you name a conspiracy theory, it's automatically true. Conspiracy theories, some are true, some are not. Some are just like ridiculous and foolish and silly, and others are quite true, okay, to be clear. I'm not poo-pooing anything simply because it's called a conspiracy theory, but there is a psychology, there is a mindset, there is a particular personality type, quite frankly, that's very much drawn to conspiracy theories. And it tends to be a bit more of a, um, let's just say untrusting personality. You could say paranoid. In some cases, it certainly is paranoid. But those who tend to be very skeptical, which I am, but then cross into the realm of just being very, um, as I said, untrustworthy. And there's some organizations, entities, governments, peoples, groups, etc., that are not worthy of our trust. I want to be clear. But then there are those who see a demon behind every tree. Every preacher, every ministry, every organization, every politician, everyone out there, everyone is working for Satan, except for the person that sees it all, right? So people are looking for this big umbrella that through which they can interpret everything out there. And it's interesting that once someone has, has uh, grasped or you know, has claimed one of these grand meta narratives, these big umbrellas, everything is forced to fit under this. So if you say the Roman Catholic Church is the greatest embodiment of Babylonian religion, then you go, well, what about Islam? Islam's way bigger, more violent. They'll go, oh, well, actually, Islam was created by Roman Catholicism. It's kind of under the umbrella of Roman Catholicism. And I talked about this last week, this um, false claim that Roman Catholicism actually created Islam, an idea that was spread throughout much of the Christian churches by a man named Alberto Rivera, a fraud, a proven fraud, and then it was very much popularized by um, his friend Jack Chick, who wrote the Jack Chick tracks, and he made comics and so forth. So there is a natural human propensity, again, to look for these grand meta narratives that explain everything, and the, the, the neater and simpler they are, um, the easier or the more widely they're embraced, but we need to be aware of this psychology. Life is very complicated. The world is complicated. People are complicated. And sometimes there are meta narratives that explain a lot of things, but there's also always going to be parts of the story that just don't fit under the same umbrella. I mean, it just, it's not that simple. So the thesis, um, again, this, I'm just going to call it the Nimrod myth the Nimrod legend. This thesis holds that all religions, not just Roman Catholicism, but really all religions of which Roman Catholicism is the biggie, again, the big mama, um, will be brought under the Antichrist umbrella in the last days by sort of this mutual Babylonian Nimrod religion. Now, as I said, although this thesis creates the perfect grand narrative through which we might imagine how Satan will deceive the whole world together in the last days, and please hear me, this story is one great big lie. The, the Nimrod myth, the Nimrod legend, is one giant lie. It is a fraud. In the same way that Alberto Rivera was a fraud, this whole story is verifiably, provably a lie. Now, I could spend, I literally could spend five sessions easily just debunking the Nimrod myth. We're just going to kind of go through it a bit more quickly here in this session. So the first problem with the Nimrod legend, let's just start here. What does the Bible say? What does the Word of God say? There are only nine verses in the entire Bible about the Tower of Babel, and there's only nine verses about Nimrod. So there's not a tremendous amount of information about Nimrod 
and the city or the tower that he was instrumental in the founding and the building of. Again, 18 total verses, and we can draw a bit out from that. I'm not saying there's no information there, but it's very limited. The Bible nowhere affirms the very basic tenets of the Nimrod myth, this idea that he married Semiramis and they gave birth to Tammuz. There's actually no biblical evidence to support that whole story at all. That entire story is found in extra-biblical legends, apocryphal texts, pseudopigrapha, deuterocanonical texts, and this sort of thing. All right, okay? It is not in the Bible. And so we need to say, if it's not in the Bible, do I trust this particular text? Do I trust this particular story? We know we trust the Bible. We know the Bible's unchanging. But all these other texts, they may hold elements of truth, but can we prove it? And does the story make sense? Okay. So the documents, and by the way, if you're interested in studying this out a bit more, I just always have to point out there's a whole chapter on this subject in my book, Mystery Babylon, free and available on the Frontier Alliance International app, free on my website as a PDF file. So the Nimrod myth or legend is found in the works of Philo, Josephus, Pseudo Philo, Okay, so a Philo pretender. Some of the stories are found in the Talmud. The Syllabine Oracles, a very popular collection of prophecies that were popular in the Second Temple period. Another um, Arab book called the Book of Rolls. Um, Pseudo Methodius, an apocalyptic uh, text from probably the 7th or 8th century. Something referred to as the Book of Jasher. Not to be confused, to be clear, with the book of Jasher that's referenced in the Old Testament, but a more modern um, document that's referred to or calls itself the book of Jasher. And then a man named Alexander Hislop. Alexander Hislop was a Scottish minister from the 1800s who wrote a book um, that has been widely influential. We're going to talk about that in, in some detail. Now, here's the thing. Many of the Nimrod traditions, so if you go, okay, but maybe these traditions hold truth. The problem is, if you work through all of these different documents, the stories that they tell about Nimrod contradict each other. What one says contradicts another one. So how do you know if there's any truth there, which one is true, and how do you decide? The stories are contradictory. For example, some of the traditions actually portray Nimrod as a righteous and godly man. Now, that obviously conflicts with the Nimrod as the Antichrist figure, who's going to sort of, you know, the Antichrist is almost going to be like a latter days Nimrod. That certainly conflicts with that. So is that true, or is the whole Nimrod was evil storyline true? Which one? How do you decide? Again, the only thing we have to go on is the Bible. None of them say anything. None of any of these texts, please hear me, everything except for Alexander Hislop's book, none of them say anything about Nimrod marrying Semiramis. None of these extra-biblical documents say anything about Nimrod ever marrying a woman named Semiramis. So where does that story come from? It comes from Alexander Hislop. It comes from a Scottish minister in the 1800s. That's where the story started. And it is widely held throughout large sections of the prophecy community today. And it's a new idea that was originated and invented and created by Alexander Hislop. <clears throat> now, another problem with the Nimrod myth, as this whole approach, this whole grand meta-narrative, is that once you cast Roman Catholicism as pagan, as I said, it ends up absorbing all of Christianity. So I've got a picture here that you can find online, and here you've got a picture of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and then the Dove, which is the Holy Spirit. And of course, this particular article says, oh, that's who you think it is. The reality is that Son is actually Tammuz. Who you think is Jesus is actually a satanic, pagan, false god. God the Father, that's Nimrod. The dove, that represents Semiramis. So you can see even historical Christian doctrines such as the Trinity are then treated as pagan. So once this meta narrative takes over, everything gets absorbed by it, and Christianity itself is reframed as pagan. And what's so funny about this 
is as I'm teaching this, is going to be I'm going to upset a whole bunch of people. How dare you say that Alexander Hislop wasn't teaching the truth? Absolutely, he was not. What's so funny about this is that there's a whole group of atheists out there. They recognize the silliness of this all, and they use this mindset to try to make fun of Christianity. And so one of the things they've done is they've taken the Christian ichthus fish, and they've kind of created these um, satirical Jack Chick Track like comic books, and they go, actually, all these Christians thought that it's the fish, that it's ichthus, but actually... And they have this sort of cartoon that it's actually a, a woman, it's not a fish, and the whole idea is that Christianity is actually just a, it originated as a sex cult, a fertility cult, and they go, oh, see, Christianity is actually just a pagan uh, sex cult, you know. And, you know, of course, they're, they're being satirical, but they're using the same mindset, they're using the same logic that Jack Chick and Alexander Hislop and folks like um, Alberto Rivera use to try to frame the Roman Catholicism as pure evil. Now listen, there are traditions of man, as I said last week, that have crept into Roman Catholicism. There are things that as a Protestant I thoroughly disagree with, but that doesn't mean that it is the embodiment of pagan Babylonian religion. What that means is that it is a Christian um, a segment of Christianity that has accumulated uh, calcified traditions of man, quite frankly. Various traditions have been added, various um, innovations, religious innovations, and they have become dogma over the years. But the root itself is still Christian. Roman Catholicism is tied back to the early church. It has been perverted in many ways. They've added traditions. But that it doesn't go back to Babylon. There's simply no truth to that whatsoever. So Alexander Hislop, he wrote the book, as I said, The Two Babylons, the subtitle of which is this, ready? The papal worship, in other words, Roman Catholicism, proved to be the worship of Nimrod and his wife. That's the subtitle of the book. Roman Catholicism is proven to be the worship of Nimrod and his wife. The book is called The Two Babylons. It was written in 1865. It actually went through a couple uh, iterations, but 1865, so mid 1800s people treat this book like they they you know they'll buy these old original copies like they have it on the shelf next to their bible like it becomes the key to understand biblical prophecy he is viewed as uh, like this genius that solved the puzzle he broke he really dug deep he did all of his research it's got thousands of references and you read it and you go wow this is amazing this explains everything and there are, again, certain segments of the body of Christ that still look to this as this incredibly important. And, and there's been multiple books that have been written that have sort of tried to update and modernize all of the claims written um, in the two Babylons. One book is called Too Long Under the Sun uh, by Richard Reeves. Another one was written by a name ma named Ralph Woodrow, Reverend Ralph Woodrow. And what's interesting is that later, Reverend Woodrow recanted, renounced, repented of this book, and wrote another book correcting his first book and saying, you know something? Alexander Hislop was out to lunch, and I was out to lunch for listening to him. It's historically inaccurate. These claims are fraudulent. Like, that takes tremendous character, for what it's worth, to write a book correcting your previous best-selling book. You really have to honor, honor him for that. So the very foundation of Hislop's thesis is in conflict with known facts of history. So here's another picture here. You've got Semiramis, Nimrod, and then there is Tammuz. Nimrod is framed as the sun god. Um, Semiramis is framed as the moon goddess. And this particular little graphic that I pulled off of the internet, it says, and Tammuz, well, guess what? Is this a coincidence? He was born on December 25th. And you'll see that everywhere. Well, you know something? Tammuz was not born on December 25th. There is no historical basis for that whatsoever. This is just people trying to manipulate things to try to make it look like, oh, you know, this whole Nimrod myth actually has some weight. There's no truth to the idea that Tammuz was born. You'll find claims, you'll find this claim all over the internet. Try to trace down its original source. It doesn't exist. It does not exist. 
Now, here's the thing. Here's the kicker. If there was even a woman named Semiramis, if she even existed, she didn't live at the same time as Nimrod. If, and, and so scholars try to go like, well, who is Semiramis? Was she even a historical figure? Here's the thing is, if Semiramis even was a real woman, okay, she lived over 1,200 years, over 1,200 years after Nimrod. Now, <laughs> I'm not a biologist or a scientist, but I can guarantee you that that pretty much guarantees that Nimrod was never married to Semiramis. They lived well over a millennia apart from one another, if Semiramis was even a real person, okay? So the very story itself, like the story itself, simply it's, it has this huge hole in it, this massive anachronism. But again, don't let the facts get in the way. So when you read Alexander Hislop's book, for what it's worth, and I have, I've read it. I should have brought a copy here. I've got a couple of copies. What he does, his approach, his methodology, is he finds connections. He finds connections and he says, well, this proves what he's trying to prove. So he'll find some common symbol, some common image, anything that he can construe as a connection. And then he says, well, this proves that this is that. And it's silly stuff. But it's anything, and this is the, again, that sort of paranoid mind. And let me just say this too, you know, because again, I'm going to offend a lot of people when I say conspiracy theories and paranoia, because there's a lot of people out there that will watch this, that really ascribe to a lot of these ideas. I've had, um, I've known three different people in my life since I've been a believer, three different people, two of which I was pretty close to, who as adults slipped into schizophrenia, paranoid, delusional schizophrenia. One of the guys I was very, very close with, a, an incredibly intelligent, really solid Christian, really solid Christian. And later in life, because usually schizophrenia is something that you slip into oftentimes in your 20s, start showing signs, kids are in college, incredible stress. And the earlier you catch it and take the proper medication, usually the be better you can keep it at bay. But occasionally people slip into schizophrenia later in life. Now, let me just tell you about one of my friends. Um, and I want to be careful um, because who knows, maybe he, he, he might even watch this. And my purpose here is not to um, uncover anyone. But I worked with this guy for a few years. And um, he, again, a great brother. He was a good friend. But he used to listen to Alex Jones like a couple hours a day, every day. And then when Alex got over, he would listen to some local, really extreme, you know, uh, type of talk radio. It was like all day long, all he did is he just drenched his mind in all of this anger and these conspiracy theories. And I'm not saying everything Alex Jones says is wrong, but there's just kind of a particular spirit. This is another false flag. Ah, you know, like it's just everything government does automatically false flag. Well, after a few years, and this guy was an intercessor. I mean, he used to pray every morning. He would get up and he would pray for an hour at least, first thing in the morning and this type of thing. I mean, a really solid brother. He would fast and pray. He loved the Lord, memorized the word. But he saturated his soul, saturated his spirit with all of this negative kind of paranoid stuff. And after a few years, he told me, you know, um, because he was listening on the radio to, to all of this stuff, um, I forget what it's called, like Operation Stargate or, you know, the idea that the government has the secret spy program. And that is real, by the way, the CIA actually did have that. Um, it, it, it was a documented part of American history. In fact, I actually know people that were part of this CIA program. I won't go down that road, but it's, it's very much real. Like I actually know people who worked for the CIA who were part of this. Um, he started believing that the government was sending psychic spies to spy on his prayer life. And he started talking about this a little bit. I was like, wait, wh what are you trying to say here? He goes like, when I'm praying in the morning, he goes like, maybe I'm praying for you or praying for this. I can hear them. I can hear them chuckling and laughing at me. They're, he goes, they're so cynical. They're so dark. Those guys are evil. Like, wait a minute, you, you hear as you're praying. He goes, yeah, I can hear them. It's like they're listening in on my prayer life, and they're just mocking, making all these little comments. He's like, they're nasty people. 
I'm like, wow, this sounds like you're hearing voices. He gradually slipped into full-blown paranoid schizophrenia. Now, here's the question. Did you have an individual with a, with a biological, chemical, emotional propensity toward schizophrenia who was drawn to listen hours a day to Alex Jones? Or did an otherwise healthy brain subjecting itself to paranoid, conspiratorial, negative talk hours and hours a day, did that lead to paranoid schizophrenia? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? And I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a little bit of both. It's kind of a weird thing. But here's what I do know is that, one, there are personality types that are drawn to this thing, and I could get into the details with some of my other friends. They were always drawn to the conspiracies, always really like, no, this makes sense, always looking for these things. But eventually, they slipped into schizophrenia. Um, one of the dear brothers that ended up taking his own life because it was so severe. The struggle was so severe. Um, there, there, there are personality types that are drawn to this thing. And it is a, like, any psychology, like, there are identifiable character traits and thoughts and ideas that lead to this. Now, when you read Alexander Hislop, he was brilliant. He was an incredibly brilliant guy. There is no question in my mind that he had schizophrenia, that he had paranoid schizophrenia. There's no question in my mind. What he does is everything for him is a connection. And he doesn't say, well, here is a possible connection. He says, well, look at this and notice that it aligns with this. Who can deny that this is proof? So let me just give you an example. Right now I'm wearing a green shirt, a green chamois. The color of Islam is green. There might be someone out there right now watching going, what kind of secret message is Joel trying to send us? Why is he wearing green? Maybe he works for the sheikhs and the mullahs and this type of thing. And you would be very wrong if you said that because it's just a mere coincidence that my wife bought me a chamois green shirt for Christmas. And so now I'm wearing my new green shirt. And I like the color green among other colors. There is no, I'm not working for Islam. There is no secret message. But someone out there will see that connection. And to them, it is absolute proof that I'm somehow sending a secret message. And you go, well, that's a real leap. Yes, Alexander Hislop's book is filled with leaps. Now, maybe you saw the movie. It's a story about a guy named John Nash. It was played by Russell Crowe. It's probably 20-some-odd years old now. And it was about a guy who was recruited back during the Cold War to the CIA. He was a professor at a college. He was a brilliant genius. Alexander Hislop was a smart guy. John Nash, a very, he's a real person, by the way, he was recruited by the CIA to ferret out Soviet messages, encrypted Soviet messages, in mainstream um, American media. And if you've seen the movie, you know, he'll pull out a uh, comment, I mean, I'm sorry, a, a magazine or a newspaper, and he starts circling letters and drawing lines, and he would see patterns and connections and things, and he would say, surely, this is a message, the Russians are saying this and this. It was all a delusion. It was all in his mind. He had slipped into full-blown paranoid schizophrenia. And there's a point in the movie where he has out in the garage where after he promises he'll stop and then I think his kids find out in the garage, he has what we'll call the crazy wall. And different iterations, versions of the crazy wall have been seen in all kinds of movies. I'll throw in a little picture here where he's got all these pins, you know, up on the, up on the, the cork board and he's got all these strings and, you know, and he's go, this is connecting to that and see this article in this picture here and, you know, and it all makes sense. You just need me to explain it to you. Guys, that is Alexander Hislop. Think about this. John Nash was brilliant. And I guarantee you, if you sat down and said, explain to me how the Russians are sending this message, he could explain connections and you might not fully understand it, but you go, I think it, it seems to make sense. But then you, when you really test the foundations of it, you go, no, this guy's seeing things that are not there. Alexander Hislop, Scottish minister, was brilliant. He saw things that were not there. It's all based on these connections. We're going to tease this out a little bit just so you'll, I'm not just going to make these claims and move on. I, I'm going to establish this. But again, I could do five sessions on this. Perhaps the most common logical, just logical fallacy that Hislop repeatedly fell back on is simply the logical fallacy of false equivalence. It's very simple. 
Again, my green shirt does not equate to I am being paid for by Muslims. Okay, that's false equivalence. You can make the connection green. Yes, green is the color of Islam, but there is no connection. If you say there must be a connection, this is proof. That's called false equivalence. So whenever Hislop found two things that shared any similarity whatsoever, for him, it wasn't a possible connection. It was proof. Again, the title of his book is Proof. Proof that um, papal worship is the worship of Nimrod and Semiramis. So beyond this, and this is actually kind of a side issue, but it's, it's worth pointing out. Hislop was a brazen racist. And this racism, this anti-black, anti-African racism is brazen in his book. Maybe this could fly under the radar in the mid-1800s, but you read it now and you're like, why, what? What in the world? So according to Alexander Hislop, here's a quote from his book, Nimrod was a Negro. And then he says this, the real original of the black adversary of mankind. So he says Nimrod was black because he was a sort of puppet of the original black adversary, in other words, the devil, the recognized representative of the devil. Now, can you imagine saying that now? Well, because this guy's black, because he's black, that proves that he is a representative of the devil. Like, wait, what? This is in this book that people revere as this incredible key to understand biblical prophecy. So here is a picture from his book that he's pulled out of a book called, from, it was written by Sir J. Gardner Wilkinson. It was a book called Manners and Customs of the Ancient Egyptians. So this is an example of Hislop's research. He goes through all of these old books. He looks at the pictures and he sees this picture, and this is a picture of Osiris, the Egyptian god Osiris. You can see the picture here. Now here's what Hislop saw when he saw this picture. He claims to have found unequivocal evidence, in other words, proof, that Osiris is actually Nimrod. Because again, remember, he says, Nimrod founded the primordial original Babylonian satanic religion, and then from there it spread. It eventually spread to Egypt, it spread to Rome, it spread to the Vatican. And every religion in the world is actually just the original Babylonian religion using different names. Okay, so that is what he says. So he says, I have found proof that Osiris is Nimrod. Where's the proof? Here's what he says. He says, Nimrod was also represented as a veritable Negro. In Wilkinson, that's this book that he's, he's working through, he says, maybe found a representation of him, in other words, a picture, with the unmistakable features of the genuine Cushite or Negro. So Hislop looks at what is basically a cartoon drawing that someone drew, like a sloppy cartoon drawing of an image of Osiris that they probably saw in Egypt, and they reproduce this really just like incredibly chintzy drawing. And he looks at it and he goes, this guy's clearly a Negro. He has the marks of a Negro. And this guy, therefore Osiris was black, and that proves that Nimrod was black. You go, wait, what? Where are these features? I mean, you know, like, anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to tease this out, but this is his logic. Hislop's proof becomes even crazier. This is where, this is, this is the nail in the coffin for him. This is the proof is in the pudding. First, he says, Nimrod was a hunter. So follow this logic. Follow this incredibly brilliant logic. Like, this is craziness. He says, the Bible says that Nimrod was a hunter. And then he says, and hunters oftentimes were associated with leopards. You might be able to prove that. And then because Osiris here is wearing clothes that have dots, and leopards have dots, and so here's his statement. He says that dress directly connects him to Nimrod. There it is. This drawing of Osiris that has polka dots on it directly connects him to Nimrod. The Negro featured, because he looks like a Negro, the Negro featured Osiris is clothed from head to foot in a spotted dress, which is connected with leopards, which is connected to hunters, and Nimrod was a hunter. There you go, proof. 
proof, proof, proof. Like this is the kind of logic. This is, these are the types of arguments that he uses. And folks read it and they go, oh yeah, that makes sense. Guys, this is craziness. In the same way that this shirt does not connect me to Islamic supremacism, I'm not being paid by Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, okay, or Ayatollah Khomeini or whatever, like that would be craziness, that would be silliness to say that this is Nimrod because this drawing in this book that he found, a guy has polka dots and polka dots represent leopards and leopards represent hunters and Nimrod was a hunter, therefore this guy is Nimrod. You go, that's not logical at all. That's craziness. In fact, I'm just going to say it. It's stupid. Like, that's just ridiculous. Okay, there is a segment of the body of Christ when they get into this mindset. Everything out there is satanic. Again, it's just them and three of their friends that know the Lord. Everybody else is compromised by Satan. Everybody else is working for Satan. I see it constantly. People leave comments on YouTube or they say, they, oh, I knew you work for the devil, you work for Rome, you work for this guy, you work for that. I'm like, really? Really? Like you think I work for Rome, I work for Islam, I work for the Zionists or some combination thereof. I work for the Pope, the Zionists and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Like really? Like I get, pe people believe that. They think every Christian minister out there is actually secretly worshiping Satan on purpose. It's a very paranoid world. It's a very sad world where there's a demon everywhere. It's basically like, who do you give more credit to, God or the devil? I think your devil is way too strong and powerful. Like, my God is sovereign. Satan's, yeah, he, you know, he's got his tentacles into a lot of things. But he's nothing. He doesn't can. Hey folks, thanks for watching the Maranatha Global Bible Studies. We pray that these resources encourage you. It has been a value to us from the beginning of FAI to produce quality media to resource the global body and give it away for free. Free and free forever. Now that said, if you want to join us in reaching those who do not have the gospel, we invite you to jump in on our $5 a month giving campaign. Literally skip a coffee and you can change the face of the Middle East in the 1040 window. Head to FAIstudios.org where you can give safely and securely. Maranatha. And so here it is. Again, because leopards have spots, and here's the quote. We may be sure, Hislop says. We, like, we can have surety. We may be sure the spotted dress was intended to identify Osiris with Nimrod. The proof is in the polka dots, friends. Polka dots prove it. It's just, it's, it's absolute craziness. Here's another picture that's actually on the cover of his book. It's uh, Dionysus, the Greek uh, god. And in, the, in this picture, he's holding a fawn, a baby deer, that also has spots because deer, baby deer, have, or fawns, whatever they're called, have spots. He actually goes on to say, well, yes, it's a deer, but when I see spots, I think leopard. And he's basically saying, see, Dionysus is also Nimrod because he's holding a deer and deer have spots and leopards have spots and leopards are associated with hunters and Nimrod was a hunter and therefore there's proof that Dionysus is also Nimrod. Now, not only does Hislop cast Nimrod as an evil, he casts him as a giant because it says that Nimrod was a gibor hunter. He was a mighty hunter. And so from that, Hislop says, well, Nimrod was a giant. He was one of the Nephilim. The problem with that is a couple verses later, it says he became a mighty hunter. It doesn't say he was a giant. It says he went on to become a mighty hunter. So Hislop frames Nimrod as a giant Nephilim black man, a Negro, and then he casts Semiramis as a beautiful, blue-eyed, blonde-haired woman. So again, nothing racist here at all, but this is the embodiment of the satanic duo that Hislop sees. A giant black man married to a blue-eyed, blonde-haired woman. Okay, now what is the most sacred, central symbol to Christianity? It's very simple. It's the cross. The cross is the picture of God's love for us. He loved us so much that he laid down his life. He took on flesh. He sent his very beating heart into the earth, into the world, to take on flesh in order that he could ultimately 
be tortured, spit on, mocked, shamed, betrayed, mutilated, torn apart, murdered for us so that we, his enemies, could become his children, so that we could inherit eternal life. The cross is a symbol of torture, but it's also the symbol. It's a reminder of what the Lord has done for us and a reminder of how we are to imitate him. We are to also take up our crosses and say yes to the challenges, the difficulties, the pain, the resistance, the, the persecution in our own life in order to be obedient to God. The cross is a thing of beauty, right? Well, according to Hislop, so he's got a picture he pulls again out of some uh, early uh, you know, 19th century source. And in the picture, he has this sort of Greek um, or Egyptian person with a headband that has little X's or crosses on it. So Hislop says this. He says, now this pagan symbol, he's talking about the cross, he says it's a pagan symbol, seems first to have crept into the Christian church in Egypt. So Hislop says Jesus didn't die on the cross. Like a Jehovah's Witness, this was a popular view back in the 1800s, Jesus was killed on a tree or on a stake, not a cross. They say the cross is pagan. Jesus was killed on a stake. The problem is the scriptures clearly say that the sign was nailed above his head. Now, if your hands are like this, there's no room to nail a sign above your head. And it says his hands were outstretched and the nails were in his hands, plural. It, doesn't, it says nails were in his hands. This one nail, that's all you need. Okay, like just this, the Gospels clearly describe it. And uh, you can get into just early history. Jesus died on a Roman cross. Hislop didn't believe that, so he says the cross itself is pagan. Once you go down the road of demonizing everything, everything becomes satanic, including the cross itself. Once you demonize, once you see a demon behind every tree, you will literally end up devouring yourself. He says, this pagan symbol seems first to have crept into the Christian church in Egypt, which appears to have taken the lead in bringing in this pagan symbol. The first form of that which is called the Christian cross found on Christian monuments there is the, here it is, the unequivocal, he always says that, like, it's, it's clear, it's unequivocal, the pagan tau, or the Egyptian ankh, the sign of life. So he says the, the tau Okay, the sort of Greek cross, which ultimately originates in the Paleo-Hebrew. Um, a lot, so many languages sort of come from the original primordial uh, proto-Sinatic, Canaanitic Hebrew script. He says that it's actually a pagan symbol. Now, here's the thing, again, biblically. Ezekiel 9, I just want to touch on this. Ezekiel 9, 1 through 4. Draw near, O you executioners of the city. So here's a vision that Ezekiel is having. This angel, this, the word of the Lord says to these, these divine executioners, these angelic executioners that are going through the city. He says, these executioners each have a destroying weapon in their hand. Six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his shattering weapon in his hand. So they're going forward to kill those who do not have the mark. They don't have this proper mark on them. He says, among them was a certain man clothed in linen with a writing case. He's got a writing case and a notepad on his loins. And he called to the man clothed in linen, at whose loins was the writing case. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all of the abominations being committed in the midst of Jerusalem. So whoever does not have the mark will be killed. Those who have the mark are preserved. This is the Old Testament, one of the Old Testament foundational texts from which the concept of the mark of God in the book of Revelation is derived. And you know what the mark is? It's, the, it's basically a cross. Again, the original Hebrew letter for mark is a cross. All of the men who had the cross on their forehead were to be spared. This is a foreshadow of the seal of God, the opposite of the mark of the beast that we see in the book of Revelation. 
The cross is not a pagan symbol. You can prove it historically that Jesus was crucified on a cross, not a stake. The Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong. It's verifiably provable. But to Hislop, this was a pagan symbol. Again, once you go down the road of demonizing everything, everything is demonized. Again, the Tav, which today in the modern Hebrew is different than its original form. But the Tav is basically shaped like a cross. Today, for many Christians, reading Alexander Hislop's book, following his logic, and using his type of logic is what passes for Christian discernment. Listen, there's a difference between listening to the Holy Spirit and having discernment and simply framing everything as demonic and evil. One requires work. It, it's, it doesn't take much work. It's, it's laziness just to frame everything as evil. And I can tell you, as a very imperfect minister who does my best to serve the Lord, to listen to the Holy Spirit, to walk rightly, to test myself, to teach with integrity and honesty, I have really given myself to say, Lord, I want to walk this thing out so that when I stand before you, when all of the deeds done in the flesh are laid bare, that I won't be ashamed, that I can stand before you in confidence on that day. We all fall short, but I've made it my life goal. For people to frame me as this embodiment of satanic deception, false teacher who's purposefully on purpose trying to deceive people, like, you go, God, what is wrong with these people? What kind of world do they live in? They're coming from the world of Alexander Hislop. We need to be aware of it. Friends, don't be a Nimrod. If this is you, if you hear me and you're just offended, you're like, no, Alexander Hislop's right. I'm telling you, stop being a Nimrod, okay? Stop demonizing everybody and everyone out there. Stop demonizing and pointing the finger at all of your Christian brothers and sisters. Let me just end by demonstrating a few silly examples. Here's a picture that... um, this is old, obviously. I was younger here, and I didn't have the beard. Still had a lot more hair. But someone went through a video. They went through videos of, like, 20 different preachers. And, look, I'm a Portuguese, Italian. I talk with my hands. If you, you, you watch, you know that I am very expressive. They went through videos, and they combed through, and they watched for my in freeze frame when my hands, you know, are a certain way – And they would take pictures and say, see, look at Joel. He's making all of these satanic hand signs, proof that this guy is working for the devil. And it's funny when you look at it because I'm doing, you know, certain things, but most of them are just dumb, you know, but no proof. There it is. It has nothing to do with the fact that I'm Italian and I gesticulate a lot because it's in my blood. No, 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 no. It's, It's proof that he's satanic. Like, really? Someone took hours and hours and did this. It's like... It's like some weirdo, like these psychopaths that go around and, 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 you know, rape and kill people. And then you find their lair and they've got all the pictures of their snuff list. Here's all the people that I've killed. Like, it's like treasures. Like, they're so proud. Look at all the people that I've exterminated. I don't understand the psychology of it. But sometimes you get these weird sites, these heretic hunters, and they list all of the ministers that I've exposed I go, you're basically just like a theological, uh, sociopathic um, serial killer. Like, ooh, this is your snuff list? Like, you think you debunked all these preachers? Like, what is wrong? What what type of mentality is this? And people go to these sites to, to learn the truth. It's nothing but, like, lurid Christian evangelical smut. Uh, You know, like the gossip. It's just, it can be really disgusting. Well... Maybe you think I'm evil, and so you think, well, this is valid. Look at, you're making all these horrible hand gestures. Here's another one. It's funny. They got Donald Trump, and he's just sitting there. You know, that's the way he sits. Well, look, his hand position is exactly like that of some other apparently satanic priest, and that's proof that Donald Trump worships Satan. There you go, hand gestures. Sometimes, look, there's only so many gestures that the hands can make. There's only so many colors out there. Listen, colors are not evil. Things like a goat, you know, like that's not evil. But Satanists use the goat as part of their symbol. Yeah, they do. But you know something? God made goats. You know, or in this picture here, you've got the six-pointed star. I've talked about this a lot in the past. That's not really the star of David. It's a sign of Satan, blah, blah, blah. No, for most people in the world, it's a sign of the state of Israel. Satan doesn't own shapes. Shapes, symbols, colors, they mean what 
the person that designs the symbol says it means. If I say I was not making um, satanic hand gestures, you need to trust me. Either that or I'm lying. But the bottom line is the person who says these things is the one that should be listened to. And I'll just end here. This is my ministry logo that I created some years ago. And look, I've worked in art and artistic, um, the, the field of artistic design for 20 years. I had my own decorative painting company. And I really love like Middle Eastern architecture and design. I've said this quite a few times. I love Middle Eastern tile, different things. I even love mosques, you know. Yes, I disagree with the worship that takes place there, but some of the mosques in Iran, and so, I mean, like they're just magnificent structures. I hate modern structures. Everything is just, I mean, architecture is really bland, like make architecture art again. I love that idea. So when I designed my ministry logo, I chose the eight-pointed star, which is the most identifiable, well-known symbol, architectural symbol in the fretwork, in the Moroccan fretwork. I mean, throughout the Middle East, when you see the eight-pointed star, you think the world of the Middle East, you think Islam. Now, my ministry, my calling is to primarily minister in the Middle East, primarily to Muslims. So I took this eight-pointed star, and in the middle, I put the crown of thorns. I didn't want to go with anything too brazenly, obviously Christian, like a cross. I took one step back from that. I put in the crown of thorns, which represents the gospel. This ministry symbol represents, I designed it, it represents my call to bring the gospel to the Middle East. But you wouldn't know that if you read the comments. Thousands of comments over the years. What's that symbol? What's that satanic symbol? La, la, la. Like as if Satan owns the eight-pointed star so that anyone who uses it, it's irredeemable. Like you have an awfully big Satan. I go like, my Satan is way smaller than that. God designed every shape. Like the, the six-pointed star, people go, oh, that's evil. I go, really? Well, God made snowflakes and they're shaped just like it. Did Satan make snowflakes or did God? You look at pomegranates when they blossom, almost mo all of them, not all of them, but most of them have the six-pointed star of David at, in that blossom at the top. Did Satan make that or did God make? No, God designed that. Yes, Satan has tried to appropriate. He tries to steal. He tries to usurp colors, images, even animal shapes, but he doesn't own them. Why do we give Satan credit? We shouldn't do that anymore. So again, Friends, stop being a nimrod. Now, let me just wrap this up by saying this. Again, we had to go through all of this because it's such, a, such an influence in the discussion of Revelation 17 and 18, this prophecy of mystery of Babylon. Again, coming from Alexander Hislop's world, the idea is you have this original satanic religion. All religions are basically an extension of that original satanic Babylonian religion. And then in the last days, it will come back. And it's the Catholic Church. You know, or some other you know, hybridized version. But there's, there's a million different versions of this story. F friends, the entire story about Hislop and Semiramis and Tammuz and all of that, it's fraudulent. It was created in the 1800s by a man who arguably was brilliant, but arguably was schizophrenic. And it's time for us to put childish things away Focus on what the Word of God says and stop paying attention to childish myths. These things are far more, far too important to tantalize ourselves with all these fun little stories and conspiracy theories and myths. Like, it's, we're down to the wire. It's time to take these things soberly and seriously. So, amen and amen. I'm going to leave that right there. Um, I think next week we will begin discussing the issue of Jerusalem. Could Jerusalem be the great harlot? So that's going to be a big one. We may even take a few sessions on that. So amen and amen. God bless you guys. Everyone have a fantastic and blessed week. Look forward to seeing you soon. Until then, Maranatha. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the teaching, but we wanted to make you aware of a gathering that we're hosting in Dallas, Texas, July 13th, 14th, and 15th of 2023. It's called the Maranatha End Times Summit. You can go to maranathasummit.com for more information. It's going to be a very powerful time together in the Word, going deep in the subject of the end of the age and the return of the Lord. We hope to see you there. Go to maranathasummit.com for all the information, details, and registration information.